Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us here tonight. Glad to have you here for Ask Julie Anything. Tonight we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we've prepared questions for Julie and I'm going to ask them and we are going to move through them, do Q&A at the end and hopefully help a whole lot of, of cat lovers here tonight. As always, we can chat in the chat feature. That'd be great. If you wouldn't mind changing your settings to all panelists and attendees so we can all join the conversation, that'd be great. And if you have Q&A, submit it at the bottom of your screen using the Q&A button. Without further ado, Julie, thanks for joining us tonight. Happy to have you here. Hi, everybody. So this is kind of new for me because um, I'm used to just, well, we still are going to free flow for sure because, um, Steph, are you going to ask me the questions or how are we going to do it? Yeah, I'd like to ask the questions. Um, okay. So tonight the topic is raw food for cats. And the reason we chose that is because uh, we have this Facebook group where quite a few of us hang out in the community and a lot of people are asking about making the switch to raw for their cats. And right. we know that in your veterinary clinic um, in Vancouver, you not only love cats, but you help thousands of them. And you've got quite a bit of experience there. So we thought, what better topic than to talk to you about that tonight? So Great. Uh, I also feel like cats just don't get enough attention. Like I think, I, I honestly believe that. Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, there's not a, there's no separation. There's no hierarchy. You know, someone that has a ferret, I'm sure loves them as much as, as we love our dogs or our horses or our cats or for me, kids or anything. Um, so I just, I just feel like I don't, I don't really know what it is. I don't know why cats don't get a, as big a, as big of a draw or as big of a, um, I don't know. They just don't get the attention that that dogs do so i'm i want to try and shift that a little bit because i really believe that that they deserve it and i'm a big massive cat lover and uh like like you said stephanie i i treated tons and tons and tons of cats at my clinic i um i worked with an incredible group called the vancouver orphan kitten rescue and with um, some amazing amazing people that started I, I kind of stepped in at the very beginning of it where um, a lot of kittens were euthanized that were, that were orphans because if they came into the SPCA or they came into um, a, a, some kind of rescue group and that's because they had to be um, tube fed, right? So every, every two hours, every four hours and they just didn't have the staff. So this incredible woman, Karen Duncan, um, and her, her, her good friend Maria, they started the Vancouver Orphan Kitten Rescue and I worked with them from their conception. And um, probably, I think they rescued approximately about 1800 cats a year. And I worked with them for 11 years before, 11 or 12 years before I left. So yeah, along with all my other regular cat, cat clients, plus all of that, I saw thousands and thousands of cats. So Mm -hmm. Awesome. I've got a couple really nice comments here from Facebook. Uh, Jay Kennedy from the Two Crazy Cat Ladies said, oh. yes, Julie, it's so true. Cats are often overlooked. And Noor from Paris said that she switched her cat to raw food three years ago from human grade wet food. And he's a very healthy 10 year old kitty now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, do you want to start asking me questions or? Yeah. The first okay. question, Julie, is why is raw food important for cats? So what I historically do, I mean, there's, there's many, many, many reasons, but I think to understand it completely, um, cats, when you look at species-oriented food, which we, which we all follow and aspire to do, uh, when you look at cats, cats orig are originated in the desert. So what that first thing that you think about is how would they get water, right? They're, they didn't have um, access to water on a regular basis. So they're designed to actually ingest and become hydrated 
through the blood of their prey. That's, that's, that's literally how cats got their moisture at, at, when they originated. So when you think about that, the, the absorption of their, of their water or their, their hydration is different than people, it's different than dogs. They're not meant to go and drink and then absorb, absorb the water through the same process as a human. They're meant to, the absorption of fluids is meant to happen at the same time as digestion. So when you think of them in, ingesting the blood of, of a mouse or a bird or whatever their prey is, that is how cats got hydrated. So what we've done, just even from, a, from that perspective, when we look at feeding, let's say cats dry food, it's probably the most counterintuitive thing that you could possibly do for a cat. And the, the, the concept behind that is because not only are they eating food that's dry, but it's going into their digestive system and instead of giving moisture the way it should be giving moisture. It's actually pulling moisture out of the cat's body in order to break down the food to aid in digestion. So there's a lot of different opinions out there, but it's a very strong opinion of mine that the reason that we see so much kidney failure in cats and so many issues with inflammatory bowel disease, things like that, but, but really, really with kidney disease, which is probably one of the number one reasons for, for death in cats is because we are clinically dehydrating them by feeding them dry food. So it's, a, it's not whether is it good, is it bad, is it indifferent? It's dry food is the complete and polar opposite to how a cat digests its food and how it rehydrates itself. If you look at a cat's tongue and you watch a dog drink water, a dog has a little flip at the end of its, I mean, I, I believe the same with dogs is that they're, they need their hydration through blood, but they at least have a little flip in their tongue that they can slurp water. When cats drink, their, their tongues look like little knives going in and out of the water. Yes, they have the little barbs to, to suck up some water, but they don't get much water. You watch a cat sit at a bowl and drink for a really long time and then measure how much water is there. Very, very, very little do they actually, are they actually able to ingest. So the concept of feeding a cat anything but something with that's, that, the, that the fluid part of it the hydration part of it and the digestion and, and chewing and swallowing, the whole part of the process of eating and digesting, if it's not a large amount of fluid in it, like, like blood in prey, we are, we are clinically dehydrating them. So we're starting off right from scratch with disease because we aren't, we aren't feeding them the way they're, they're meant to be fed from a hydrated point of view. And we all know how important, like we can all live without food for a very long time, but we can't live without water for very long. So it's the same when you think of it, that a kitty is not getting enough water for basically its entire life if it's on on dry it's no wonder that they're not living as long uh the other thing i know I'm, I'm really talking about dry compared to wet but that's that's essentially why raw is so crucial for cats is because it enables them to digest and hydrate correctly it's it's pretty simple um I was, I, early, early on in my career, it was the very first holistic vet conference I had ever gone to. It was in Vermont. I think it was in 1996. And um, there was a really interesting veterinary dental surgeon there. And he was talking about the benefits of raw food and dental disease and um, for cats and for dogs. And he wanted to, he did an incredible lecture, but then he wanted to do he wanted to do something that we could actually tangibly understand. 
So it was kind of gross, but it really hit home and it really made sense. What he did is he made everybody chew on a biscotti on one side and a piece of apple and cheese on the other side. We had two different color um, flosses and we weren't, we could drink, but we couldn't eat anything during, during his lecture. And in between the breaks, he wanted us to, to floss with one color on the side that we ate the biscotti and a different color on the other side and tell him which side had more debris. And everybody was kind of confused about this. But anyways, his point was everybody, everybody had more debris on the side of the, of the biscotti. So his point was, well, while they're telling us to use dry food for dental health, for cats and dogs, it, the concept of, a, of them crunching on something hard, like a bone, is factual. Biting on a biscuit, like a biscotti, is completely polar opposite because you bite into it, it jams up under your gum line in between their teeth and nobody's flossing them, right? Nobody's using floss. Whereas when they're chewing on raw meat or they're chewing on, um, uh, or they're even eating canned food, it's not, they're not, when they bite into it, it doesn't jam into their teeth and go right up under their gum line like a hard cookie that then turns into a paste and literally never comes out unless you put them under a general anesthetic and use um, a tool and, uh, and dental equipment to get that out. So it's, it's completely unnatural and it causes way more disease than, than uh, dental disease, than, than raw food or canned food. So when you look at those two things alone, dental disease, which causes heart disease, can cause lots of stuff in their gut, can cause kidney issues, can cause all kinds of things. The fact that we're clinically dehydrating them it's really a no-brainer that cats should not be eating dry food. No matter how you want to slice it or dice it or how you want to look at it, it is something that is so incredibly detrimental to them that um, uh, it, it's just not even open. It's, I shouldn't say it's open. It's all, everything's always open for discussion for me. But there's, there's not a lot of science that could sway my decision that, that dry food is good for cats. I've had some people say to me, oh, we had, we had a barn cat that used to just eat dry food and it lived till it was 18 years old. But I'll tell you that cat was 90, I can guarantee you that cat was eating mice and it was eating birds. So it was, the dry food was kind of a, um, probably an added, as an added thing that, that, that was given to their, to their diet. Plus way back then, they were also not being bombarded with flea products and over vaccinated and, 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 you know, crazy stuff like that. But from the perspective of why is raw the best food to feed cats, it's because of how they're built and they aren't built to eat processed food from strictly even a digestive process. So that's why I believe yeah, so much in raw food. No, that's great. Um, a couple questions that came in about carbs and cats. Like, can cats digest carbs? Is it okay to feed some carbs? How many can they properly digest? Really, no. Not for cats. You know, dogs can. Dogs mm -hmm. for sure can. But cats really can. It's not, it's not, for, cats really are carnivores. They are probably, they are really the the main carnivore, like, you know, if, if we look at the, the process of maybe giving them something that would mimic what would be in the gut of their prey, right? So what would be in the gut of their prey? Well, they would predominantly eat, you know, birds, mice, rats, big cats eat bigger rodents and, 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 you know, zebras and, and things like that. But even when you look at big cats and cat nutrition, you would be probably seeing more things in a that in the in the gut of their prey that they're that they're consuming, like berries and seeds and um, nuts and grasses and bark, like barks from the bark from the trees, 
you wouldn't be seeing grain. Rarely would you be seeing, um, you know, wheats and oat and barley. You might be, you might, they might be eating them in their more raw form. Um, the, the, you know, and if you're going to feed carbs, um, I just saw something about fermented. That's different because it's been sprouted and the, and the lectin has been broken down. Lectin is the, the composite that, that, that contains a seed that protects the seed from uh, parasites and, and, and insects and stuff. When it's fermented, that lectin is broken down, so it's easier to digest. But on the whole, um, you wouldn't, I would never, my personal opinion in my clinic, I never, I never fed, I never recommended anything carbohydrate wise as far as grains go. Um, I did have clients and patients that did incredibly well on squashes and pumpkins when they were already in the, in a disease process. So inflammatory bowel disease, um, uh, you know, co chronic constipation, uh, megacolon, things like that, squashes, pumpkins, they, they did do, they did do really, really well. And they can, they can, um, they can do well on a small amount of pureed veg, veg, but I would never do, or, or, or juice even, right? Like a, like the juice from pureed, from pureed vegetables. But my personal opinion is I've never, ever gone higher than about 3%, unless it's been extreme cases where they have, like I said, really severe hemorrhagic IBD or, um, chronic constipation, megacolons, things like that. Awesome, Julie. Um, you've already touched on this quite a bit. Can you talk a little bit more about the benefits that raw food provides for cats? Well, the, because it's digested, I mean, I did pretty much say, like, when you think of the digestive process, so we can put anything into our bodies that we want and it can say that it's the most amazing thing on the planet for us to eat. If our digestive system isn't working or your dog or your cat or whatever, digestive system is not working correctly, it doesn't really matter what you're eating if you're not digesting the nutrients. So when you look at feeding raw food compared to processed food or especially, especially dry, um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for them to digest the way that they are built to digest, the way their digestive tract is, is innately built to eat and digest the nutrients. So one, they're getting fresh food, they're not getting processed food. Two, they're, they're ingesting their hydration, right? So they're, they're not drinking water, they're ingesting their, the blood, and the, the, the way that they get hydrated. And um, so we're, prevent, we're helping to prevent kidney failure. We're helping to um, feed and nourish the cells the proper way. We're giving you know, antioxidants, we're giving amino acids, we're giving um, all different kinds of proteins. And, and, and it, is, it is, like I said, for cats, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a no brainer. But they, you know, sometimes it's hard for them to eat, get them to go on to raw, or else, or else I think everybody would pretty much be doing it. Stephanie, was that a question you were going to ask me at Julie, some point? Yeah, Julie, that's my next question. What tips can you share for, for switching a fussy cat or even just switching a, a cat to raw? So you have to do it slow. Like cats are, uh, and this is like, I want everybody to hear me out there that's going to, that's going to switch to to raw i've i've heard people go oh just fast your dog and i still don't even like doing that i'm i'm so i think because i was the first one of the very well first vet clinic probably in all of canada that recommended raw food i was very scrutinized by other clinics and the emergency clinics if anything ever got sick and they were eating raw food it was instantly because it was the raw food so when I switched animals, dogs and cats, to raw food, I was really, really careful, really careful. 
almost anal about doing it, especially bones and things like that. So I hear people go, oh, well, we just fasted our dog and then put it on, on, on raw. I can tell you right now, I mean, I, I, some people might disagree with me, but I don't think that cats should ever fast. And especially a fast that is um, done by their human, their humans. And cats have a very sensitive, emotional, um, uh, they're very sensitive emotionally. They, they, I've seen cats do something, go, go into hepatic lipidosis and, um, hepatic lipidosis is when a cat stops eating and they, they, their body starts to digest their fat and their, their liver can't digest it. So it becomes fatty. They get really, really, really nauseous from it. And then they stop eating and then they get even more, they get, it even becomes more fatty. So it's called hepatic lipidosis and it's life-threatening, life-threatening. Lots of cats die from it. And they're, you know, a lot of the treatment for it is that they have to go in and have a feeding tube put into their stomach and food injected into their into their stomach directly into their stomach because the minute they eat they throw up or they absolutely refuse to eat so you can't be constantly force feeding them so i don't recommend fasting with cats and what i and i, I even don't recommend like okay so here's your raw food and we're just taking your dry food away i do it so so gradually that I take about a table, maybe not even a teaspoon of dry food out, and I feed them a teaspoon of of raw food, and then three or four days later, you can do, you know, three three teaspoons, and then or even two teaspoons and two teaspoons of of raw, so that you're you're adding raw and decreasing the 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 dry. I've even had people, even when they're almost completely switched over, leave the bowl there. Never, ever, ever take away their bowl if they're in free in their free feeding mode, because they're so used to that food bowl being there that if they come and all of a sudden their food's gone, it is a massive, massive emotional trauma to them. They they don't understand like. Where's like think about it? They're they're relying on you for food, and you're allowing them to go to food for food anytime they want, and then all of a sudden you remove their food bowl, and it's it, it's this major. I've seen just even removing their food bowl, them stop eating, just go cold turkey, stop eating, get and get really 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 sick. So I recommend doing it really really slowly. Some cats will just not touch raw. They smell it and it's like they almost gag just by smelling it. So in that case, you can try cooking it first, so long as there's no bone in it. So you try cooking it first and then you cook it a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less until they, you know, you, you go, oh, awesome. They've eaten all of it when it's fully cooked. So then in a few days, you cook it 95%. And then in a few days, you cook it 85% and then 75% and you just do it gradually until you see that maybe you're going too fast and then you slow down. So you can do it that way too. The other way that I've even had people do it is I've had them take dry food and use a rolling pin and roll it, right? So you roll it and you um, take a little piece of raw food and you roll it into a ball and then you take a tiny ball like the size of your pinky finger and then you roll the raw food into this dry the dry food powder because the, the main reason that they want to eat dry food is that it has msg in it it's got so many food additives that they, it's almost addict well it is addictive it becomes addictive for them so yes, because someone just went kitty crack. It's true. It's like it's like it, and it's why even dogs. This is gross, but why dogs will actually eat cat poop, be, and get addicted to cat poop because the same addictive MSGs and and all this stuff actually go into the feces. And I've seen dogs almost become addictive, addicted to dry 
fed cat poop. And, but anyway, so then you just roll it up, make sure that you're feeding it not in a bowl, but on a plate, right? So never, 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 ever, no matter what you're feeding, do not feed your cats in a bowl. Um, it should all, they should always be on a saucer or a flat plate or the, oh, that wonderful woman. Um, what's the, what's the, the pet platter? They have, they have really awesome, um, did, does pet platter have, have ones for cats? I believe she's, uh, launching them in. Launching them. So everyone needs to keep their eyes open for that because that's going to be incredible. Uh, so. And then you just take these little raw balls and roll them in the, in the, in the dry kibble, the, the ground dry kibble, and then you place them on a flat plate and then they can pick them up like something similar that, that they pick, they would be used to picking up their, their little kibbles, right? So it kind of feels the same. It smells the same. It's, it's not as big a transition. I've seen lots of cats transition onto raw that way. Um, and then you just do a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. And, uh, it's, that's a really good way of, of transitioning them as well. Um, you know, sometimes some people put in, even though it's horrible, but wild caught unsalted canned tuna, just a tiny little bit into some raw food, uh, to get them enticed with that. You know, some people use like brewer's yeast. I'm not a massive fan with that, of that, but I, I have heard that that works as well too. But I just saw in the chat, someone wanted to know why on a flat plate. So it's so interesting. A lot of people are talking about this now, but I discovered this by accident. Um, I had a lot of cats and I had a lot, a lot of cats that had inflammatory bowel disease, like really bad. And I would get third, fourth, fifth opinions when they would do, they've done exploratory surgeries on cats and the whole nine yards. And I had two cats that, um, when I would take a case, I, I, I was like a detective. I tried to uncover everything from, you know, what's different? What are you doing here? Why is this happening? Like it, it was, it was insane. And I, I, I had two customer, two customers, two clients or two patients with cats, um, go, it's so weird when my husband feeds one, it was when my, her husband fed and another one is they were actually divorced. And when she, when the cat would go, they sh shared custody of the cat. And when the cat went over to the wife's house the cat didn't throw up when the when it ate at the husband's house it threw up and um that was kind of funny because she was always just because you know because <laughs> it was him but i figured out that it was they were eating on flat plates and then i started doing more and more and more research of why would cats throw up not throw up if they were eating on flat plates it's like 20 years ago and it's because of their whiskers so their whiskers are so sensitive that it can create with some cats that are very sensitive, a sense of their equilibrium being off because when they're walking, they can sense how close they are to, to a, a wall or to another cat or whatever. It's their, it's their, it's, it's their, well, it does a lot, their whiskers, but their whiskers can, is a, is a massive sensory percept, has mass, massive sensory perception. So when they're putting their face in and they're eating and their whiskers are touching and moving, sometimes it gives, I would imagine, it gives the cat the feeling of being possibly disoriented or even, even just agitated, right? Just even totally agitated that when they're eating and then they would just throw up. My partner, Dion, um, he, uh, my business partner, Dion, he had them, he has the most beautiful cat, but she would throw up everything right after she would eat. And then she would throw up and then she would eat dehydrated food and she'd throw up raw food, canned food, doesn't matter. She would throw up. And I said to him one day, what do you feed it? What are you feeding her in? He said, oh, this really, this really, um, her cat bowl or whatever her cat dish and i said try feeding her on a, just try feeding her on a flat saucer and i told him why 
the cat never threw up. I mean, it sounds insane, but I've seen it. I've seen it more times than I can possibly tell you. They just, they, they thrive because they wouldn't be eating like that. They wouldn't have their whiskers swished and smushed and stuff. They lie down and they chew on their prey, right? They're, they're not in, their face isn't in a hole with their whiskers pulled back. Like think about what that might, could feel like. I'm not saying it, it works with every cat or doesn't work with every cat or every cat's that sensitive, but I've seen probably hundreds of cats do exponentially better eating on flat plates. So, um, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of went off. No, absolutely. And I've never heard of, I've never heard of the trick with the rolling pin and the dry food and making like the little raw meatballs. That's smart. I've never yeah. Heard of really, that's, that's really good to know. Yeah. We were, we got very creative at my clinic trying to, trying to, and, and it's, it's, um, you know, you do your best and you go as slow as you can. And, you know, if you, if you, if you do that, a lot of them will switch. A lot of them just haven't been given the opportunity or the time to do it. Yeah. There's one more question, Julie, uh, before we move. It is, if we can't do raw, what can we do to help? What kind of steps can we take to, to help these guys out? Um, you mean if, if they can't do, well, there's dehydrated, there's freeze dried, there's canned really like you can, for me, it would be raw first, then home cooked, then raw dehydrated or raw freeze dried, and then canned food. That would be, that would be the way I would go. I would try desperately not to feed dry. You could try taking dry and soaking it with um, bone broth, bone broth and a good digestive enzyme. I mean, that's good too. Worst case scenario, if you just can't get them off of dry or you just, you know, you just, for whatever reason, you've tried everything and you can't do it, then just incorporate as much real food as you can. If they like cooked chicken, add cooked chicken. If they like, you know, cooked fresh fish, give them cooked fresh fish, sardines. Um, you know, just try to give them as much as much real food as you can. You know, cooked cooked beef, cooked. You know, I always like to do poultry with cats because I feel it's closer to what they would be eating. But I know some cats that don't even like poultry, so people are feeding them steaks. You know, like chopped up steaks, meat, right? As much rabbit, yeah, rabbit, um, any kind of bird. Um, it's if you can get raw cream. Raw cream is incredible for cats, but raw, not 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 um, pasteurized. But raw cream, if you can get your cats to drink raw cream, or you can get a hold of raw cream, if you can get them, they usually go mental over it. But if you can get raw cream into them, it's it's amazing. Or raw goat's milk, any kind of raw milk is really good for cats, and they usually um, they usually really like it. All right, thank you, Julie, for answering everything for us. I've got quite a few Q and A. If we if you don't mind rolling into those, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, the first one, I just want to ask this really quick. Uh, Jay asked online, and Kim's got a question here too, about cats that graze and and raw being raw fed. Like, how do we how do we leave the food out for them? Or, well, first of all, cats shouldn't graze. Dogs and, and others should dogs. So, cows and horses, um, they have to graze because that's their motility. They don't have motility like people and, and, and prey animals do. Um, they need to eat and well, as they're eating, it actually pushes the food out and helps and causes them to defecate. Whereas dogs, cats, people, we have motility, right? So when we, my personal opinion for any kind of thing, any grazing, animal other than anything that's grazing other than a cow 
a horse, a goat, things that are built to graze. We are causing so much damage. We, we, cats and dogs are made to hunt, kill, and gorge. That's, that's what they do. When we turn them into cows and horses or grazers, I truly believe that we put too much of a tax on the, on the organs, on the digestive organs, especially the pancreas. So um, things like chronic pancreatitis or diabetes, I think a big, if animals are grazing, that, that contributes to it massively. But if you're grazing your cat, if your cat's allowed to free choice, like free feed, you, you, you have to make sure that you're doing it when you start to decrease it, that you do it like almost like a couple kibbles at a time and make sure like, let's say you're going, to, let's say you can't do raw and you're going to go to canned food. So, you know, when you wake up in the morning, give them some canned, let them eat it, leave their dry food out. And then when you get home at night, give them some more canned, maybe give them a little bit more canned before you go to bed, but leave the dry food out. And, and almost, you don't want them getting fat, but you would just take out a small amount of the dry food so that you're not freaking them out. Then the next day you take out more dry food and you give them more canned throughout, you know, in the morning before you go to work, when you get home before bed or a dinner before bed, um, and you, and you do it, um, you know, you do it slowly. And then eventually you can remove the bowl altogether, or it's not going to be the end of the world. If you put two or three kibbles in a bowl, just so that they have two or three kibble treats or something like that. If they're, if they're, if they're really attached emotionally to, to their, to their dry food or to their bowl. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Did some, I think someone said, hang on a second. I just think, I don't think that's the same as free feeding, free access whenever they want. My 17 year old often can only eat small amounts at a time. Oh, and then thanks Darcy. That's what I meant by grazer. Okay. So, so when you're looking at tiny amounts, that's a different situation. If it's tiny amounts, if you're talking tiny amounts of, of raw or tiny amounts of canned food, because that's how they need to digest because they've got something going on or that's fine. I have, I have my love of my life cat who's sitting right there beside me. She has a very rare tumor that we've been dealing with for many, many, many years um, on her, um, just above her, her kidneys. And um, it's, it's, uh, she eats one, two, one, two, three, four, five to six times a day I feed her. And five to six times a day I feed her raw, but I feed her five to six times a day. And then before I go to bed, she gets raw cream. So she gets fed six to seven times a day. That's fine. If, if that's, if that's, and I know, and I know lots of cats that hunt a lot, right? They don't, and they don't just eat mice, right? They'll eat spiders and bugs and different things besides just, just mice and birds and stuff. So yeah, I think that, I think that's totally fine. If your if your cat needs to eat small amounts and you can, and you can do that, then awesome. I think that's totally fine. Good. Thanks, Julie. Robin has a question about supplements or homeopathy that she can add to her cat's raw diet for moderate HCM. For moderate, let me look at it. Uh, Out there. Who is it? Which one? Oh, Robin, sorry. Yeah. Saddle from, oh dear, what supplements or homeopathy can I add to my cat's raw diet from moderate juice? And his brother died three weeks ago for saddle thrombosis. Ugh, we don't, not so sad. Did not know either brother had, Sam. 
Oh, wow, Bart was put on Plavix today. Peter Collier, okay. All right. Um, well, for me, for supplements or homeopathy, I would I would say phytosynergy is a is a is a really big one. Um, uh, Omega threes are really big ones. Um, coenzyme Q ten is is really good. There's there has been some studies with a we have we have very specific strains in our phytoplankton, and um, and the one proprietary strain that we use. There has been so many studies on heart on heart health. It's it's incredible. So and then you're looking at um, the different amino acids, which which cats cats and heart. I mean cats. I don't think cats get nearly enough amino acids. I think that they're, I think it's very important for cats. So I would say phytoplankton, phyto, our phytosynergy, he eats raw, that's good. Um, but still, when you look at the, when you look at the amino acids profile in phyto, phytosynergy, it is, it's, it's phenomenal. Like I was blown away when I, when I first started using it and saw, and saw that um, along with, um, and the vitamins and minerals and and the uh, superoxide dismutase is massive, massive anti um, antioxidants and uh, helps tremendously for the heart. There's been, like I said, there's been lots and there's been more and more studies done on superoxide dismutase specifically from this one strain of phytoplankton for the heart. So I would do that. I would also, um, side effects, yes. So, I mean, Nux vomica is a really good one. Um, our liver tonic really, really helps with uh, to the detoxification process of drugs. And it's incredible for their kidneys, which we always want to uh, support in cats. But to, deal, to help deal with drugs and support the liver and support the kidney and pancreas and gallbladder and all of that stuff. Liver tonic is really excellent for that. Uh, but I think, I think the, you know, the, the, the other thing that I would say is um, that, you know, when you hear about heart disease and stuff and people taking aspirin, right? And um, Arnica, I, I used to use Arnica really just like a, like a 30C Arnica uh, with all my heart patients, I would just use it once a week, just one single dose once a week as a, as a prevention. Uh, Sarah Griffith, if you want to put Sarah's, Sarah's um, thing in the chat, mm -hmm. she would be a really good one to talk to about, about um, she's, she's a cat. She's when it comes to nutrition, she's, she's, my go-to for my for my cats. Her she worked with large cats, big cats. So and did um, lots and lots and lots of of, of species-oriented nutrition and stuff. So she'd be able to help you really specifically for your cat. But phytosynergy, liver tonic, uh, coenzyme Q10, um, and uh, you know arnica, just like once a, just once a week. One single dose of 30C is it can be really helpful if you know that they have heart disease. Thanks, Julie. I put Sarah Griffiths there in the chat and I put it on Facebook as well for everyone watching. Susie okay, has a question. It relates to protein, fat, calcium, and omega 3s. It's a three part question. Okay. Um, she wants to know what is the proper protein to fat ratio? Do cats need less fat than dogs? And is it okay to feed one day of a higher fat meal, say 13%, and alternate with a lower fat meal, say eight or 9%? So that's a really, really good question. And um, we just posted, is, is Susie, are you from Canada or from the US? Gosh, Okay, um, we just posted something where we're gonna post it as soon as we're done. Karen Becker's doing a, um, a thing to try and get uh, tests like the top 10 
dog foods, I think dog and cat foods in Canada uh, to take a look at stuff. I, I'm such a believer in, in getting the proper fats and the proper proteins through rotation. So feeding different, different kinds, um, um, different kinds of, like if you're, if you're doing pork and then you're doing turkey and then you're doing lamb and then you're doing a, a fish, you're gonna, you're gonna get a, a better balance, in my opinion, of fat versus protein ratio when you try and keep the species of which they're eating in its more natural state. So rather than, rather than, like, so if you're feeding whole, whole, carcass let's say um if you're feeding a whole carcass where they've taken basically the, the entire animal and grinding them up you're gonna get that species you're gonna get the correct ratio for that animal right that they're that are they're ingesting because the the correct ratio of fat to protein in a bird compared to the correct ratio of fat to protein in a rat or a chipmunk or a whatever um uh then then you're you're not you're not putting things so much into this is exactly how it has to be that 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 would be personally what i would what i do with my cats that's what i do with my cats i rotate their proteins so that they're getting the correct ratio of fats to protein dependent on the species that they're eating I do the same with my dogs. And I heard, I saw something about, I don't feed pork due to the way pigs are treated in Ontario. Okay. I, you know what, Donna, I, uh, yeah, I know. I think, I think that that's, that that's true. I'm really lucky when I feed pork, the pork that I feed, I wouldn't like, I, I'm like, I, I agree with you. But the pork that I feed are all free range pork. They're all pork that's raised, they're raised outside. It's not, they're not factory farmed pork at all because I know it's disgusting. But basically everything, you know, anything that is factory farmed is, is pretty, it's pretty brutal. It's really brutal. So, you know, the same would, the same would hold true. I still think, I still think, I still think that like, when you look at a cat, would a cat be going out and eating pork, right? Not likely. So if you stick to the proteins like rabbit, like turkey, like pheasant, like um, maybe, you know, stick to the, stick to the things that they're, that they're um, maybe lamb, right? Because it's smaller. Uh, I know it's awful too, but I, I, I think if you stick to the, to the, and to the things that they would be eating duck. Yep. Yeah, and, and making sure that you're trying to get the whole, the whole ground animal, your fat ratio, if it's done properly should be, should be balanced to that species compared to balanced to the cat. Because your cat wouldn't be going out and picking specific fat and protein when it's eating an entire prey. That's that's a good, that's easy for me to understand when you explain it that way, Julie. Totally. Mm -hmm. All right, Audrey's got a question. Her cat has FHV. I'm not sure what that is. FHV. Where am I? Where are you? And you near the top there, third from the top. Yep. My cat so has stress her. Yeah. FHV, so important I don't stress her. Also yeah. trying to convert her to a healthier diet, but she's very fussy. She'll go on a food strike. She gets upset. I'm making homemade raw food for her, cooking yeah. some turkey for her, but it's very difficult to get her to take more than a few licks. Yeah. And it is important. You're right. I mean, they're the same it's very similar to people with herpes virus, right? Like it, it comes from stress. It, 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 but a lysine, right? It is, it's phenomenal. Like go and, and, and add a lysine to her, to her diet. 
Um, homeopathy can help herpes virus more than anything that that I know. It it is. Um, you want to make sure. I know that I'm talking lots about phytoplankton, but phytoplankton in cats. Oh my gosh, it's it's a it's a it's been a lifesaver in so many so many animals that I treated. I can't even tell you with dogs too. Using Euphrasia for her eyes. Yeah, that's that's. Hang on, what did she say? Due to blood. Using Euphrasia for her eyes. I've read conflicting things about the L lysine. Well. I don't know about how conflicting it is, but I've, I can tell you personally, I've seen it do phenomenal, phenomenal things for cats. Um, just make sure that you get a really super duper quality. Uh, I've, I've seen colostrum be helpful. Um, I've seen, like I said, phytoplankton. And because the, the, the levels are really, really, see, Phytoplankton, it's almost homeopathic. It's it because because it's got so much packed in such a small little tiny cell. They it works, it it's just works like magic in so many, so, so many ways. But I think that you know you want to have antioxidants, you want to reduce the stress. You want to make sure their amino acids are really, really balanced. You want to be sure that their mineral loads are, are, are adequate. Um, I think that every single animal, animal and person on this planet are, is really, really, really void in minerals. That I can say across the board. Dogs, cats, horses, people, everything is depleted in minerals because of all so our soil, everything. And the two favorite things for me for minerals is phytoplankton because you're getting ocean minerals and humic and fulvic acid, which is in our phytosphora, because then you're getting ancient soil minerals. So minerals, minerals, minerals. I think, I think, I don't think anyone can be healthy if they're not taking some form of minerals, even if they're eating the best thing on the planet. So um, remedies like nat mirror, um, good food, like, like you said, don't try not, in, not to stress her, but, uh, homeopathic remedies for, for herpes is, is just, just incredible. It's phenomenal. It works. It works so well. And euphrasia is good. You know, it really is good, but it's not really, you're not really, um, addressing it at its core. With, with just euphrasia. It can help, <clears throat> can help superficially and symptomatically. Yeah, 100%. But remedies like Nat Muir, Pulsatilla, Carcinosin, you know, depending on our personality, could, could help a lot as well. Julie, is that something that Sierra could give Audrey a hand with as well? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, her and Sarah Griffith's website is theanimalsynergist.com for anyone yeah. that can catch it. Yeah. I just saw someone say, well, phytoplankton help with hyperthyroidism. You can give, you don't have to worry about giving phytoplankton if your cat has hyperthyroid because its iodine levels aren't very high. So compared to other ocean based stuff. Awesome. Thank you. And one more quick one before we wrap it up here. Let's the Sarah see. people, yeah, she. I think she does. I think so. Um, I'm looking for one that's going to help the most people. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Omega-3 supplement for a cat that's allergic to squid, salmon, and all fish. She's currently on Phytosynergy and Evening Primrose Oil for the Omega-6. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's so hard for me to say if she's, she's allergic to... Um, squid, salmon, and all fish. And all fish, yeah. You know, I don't give 
my cats, I mean, I, my cats only have phyto synergy. So do my dogs. And I know we're, we're doing a study, so hang tight. But um, if, when you have something that's allergic to something, you, you just don't, you don't want to push it by, um, you just don't want to push it by giving them something because they need omega-3 that they're allergic to. So if, 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 if your cat's doing well on phytosynergy, I wouldn't push the envelope to try and get omega-3 into them, mm -hmm. right? Because it, 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 it definitely has omega-3s in it. So, you know, we could, you can, you know, yeah, if they're allergic, I'm just trying to see what, what else she said. Uh, uh, she's currently on phytosynergy and evening primrose oil for the omega-6. Yeah. I mean, there's one. Have, sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's one more here from the audience. Uh, two or three people have asked if we, or if you have a veterinary homeopath that you recommend. I know we have a list. Kaylin has a list that we recommend. Yeah. Well, Will Faulkner, he's a veterinary homeopath, um, depending on where you are. Um, uh, Andrea Ring, but she's not even taking any more, any more patients right now. Uh, Sarah Griffith is not a veterinarian, but she's an incredible animal homeopath, like amazing. Um, who else? Sue Armstrong in England. She's in, she's phenomenal. Uh, she's a she's a great veterinary homeopath. And I said Will Faulkner already. I don't know if Don Hamilton is taking cases. Don Hamilton's great. Um, Dr. David Evans, he might be taking cases. He's in the, he's in Canada, um, like Zoom cases and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Rob and Howard are in U.S. What about well, yeah. uh, Dr. Todd Cooney? Dr. Todd Cooney. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't worry about where they are anymore, especially with COVID. <laughs> Like people, I don't, you can't even go into a vet. I mean, so many people are doing, you know, Zoom medicine and, and things like that. It, and, and it's, it's kind of cool because I think it's, I, I, I always think that there's got to be silver linings to stuff. And I think that what we, what we see, especially with dogs is, you know, when you can, when you can do a Zoom, it's dogs and cats, your, your, the animal's so much less stressed, right? Like the, I mean, unless it's an emergency, what what better than to be able to just, you know, do a telephone consultation or do a Zoom meeting so that your your animals don't don't have to go in and go through all of that stress, right? Yeah. Totally. totally, Julie. Well, thank you for that tonight. That was great. Super educational definitely gave me some tips to consider because I'll admit that our our cat eats canned and not raw but I guess I guess the takeaway is you have to keep trying you really you have to keep trying for sure and and you can also like even if you do a little bit right even if you do a tiny little bit or even if you supplement your canned with with like um, you know cooked chicken or some kind of, of cooked meat, right? So long as it doesn't have a lot of spices and salts and things like that on it. Uh, it's, it's every little tiny bit counts, for yeah. sure. Every tiny little bit counts. Perfect. Well, thank you for, for everything tonight, Julie. Appreciate you jumping on here and sharing. Yeah. With us here. Did we, get as, did we get enough questions answered? I guess, hope so. What time is we it? Quite a, we got through quite a few and quite a few came through at the beginning. You kind of talked about as we were rolling through the session. So they did get answered one way or another. Uh, he's been diagnosed with allergies. He was on wet and dry food for, uh, from the vet. I have no idea what he's allergic to. So Suzanne has asked a question. I just wanted to maybe talk about real fast mm -hmm. because it's a one-year-old cat that has aller allergies. 
Yeah, talk to us. Suzanne, you need to get on that like ASAP because if he's only a year old, there's there's lots you can do. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots you can do. I would in this case, I would not hesitate for one second to talk to an animal homeopath or do a, a long distance consult with with a with a with a good holistic vet like or you know um there's we have a whole list of i have i've so many i can't even couldn't even sit and name off the amount of people that veterinarians and and practitioners that you could you could reach out to but um you said he was on wet and dry but was put on dry from the vet i have no uh, idea but I want to get them on raw hundred million trillion percent. You should try it and get them on raw. And what you can do is, um, um, put them up to just try to find a novel raw, right? Just to start off, try to get a novel, a novel raw, find, try to find out when the allergy started. So, um, if, if maybe, you know, you can link it to, possibly after he was vaccinated or possibly after he had a, a topical flea treatment, or if you can kind of link it to that, 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 that created the body to go into a, into a, um, sort of a, an alerted state because it, the drug forced them into an alerted state. Then there's, there's lots of things you can do to decrease that alerted state and bring the cat's especially at a year old, bring it back to its natural balance. If it's only a year old, maybe after he was fixed, hold on, what did she say? Oh. After he was fixed and put on pain meds, he had a reaction to that. Okay, so there you go, there you go. So so first thing that I would do if he was coming to me, which, which another homeopath can, is treat him for the trauma of being stressed at uh, being fixed i would i would die i mean you could you could call your veterinarian and ask your veterinarian that's if if i saw that i would call the veterinarian and find out what his pre-medication was what his premix was and find out if they use ketamine um if they use ketamine there's there's lots and lots of like cat they still do use it's, it's as scary as it sounds, they still do use ketamine a lot with pre-medications for, for general anesthetics. Um, but right there, you, you deal with the trauma, you deal with the, the, the chemical insult of whatever medication that he reacted to. Um, that's, that's cause then you're, you're dealing with it at a core issue, right? You're taking the body's energetic response of being traumatized and, and reacted. And if he's reacted to that, that would probably say that he's a fairly sensitive cat. So that sensitivity needs to be um, uh, uh, balanced again, right? So please just get a hold of somebody and, and do something because a kitty that young, you don't want that cat having to go through a lifetime of, of allergies and he's so young. There's, there's no reason why you can't nip that like really fast. Um, and Andrea Ring uh, it has our, um, actually sells the spay and neuter, the, the feline spay and neuter. If he was, he, right? So if he was neutered, uh, putting him on the neuter remedy would be really, really helpful. Getting him on some raw food. You can you can turn this around. I'm I I can't guarantee it, but I'm pretty confident that you could do that. <clears throat> maybe, maybe do that. <laughs> start over grooming. <clears throat> it's so easy for them to turn into a habit. Hold on. Ah, oh, someone's. I've got this. Make sure you are <clears throat> dealing with allergies before they start over grooming and hair pulling. It's so easy for them to turn into a habit and it's a long road to still dealing with it. Okay. With your allergic cat. So Lynn, that is, that can also be hyper, um, hypersthesia, right? 
So you're right. It's, it, it's that really, really slippery slope of an allergy then turning into a hypersthesia, which is kind of like, well, some, some people say it's strictly emotionally. Some say it's, it's, it has something to do with their spinal cord. Some people say that it's, it's a habitual, almost like a self-destructive process. There's lots and lots and lots of different things, but even from that even that, that hair pulling and over grooming, homeopathy for that is, is really, really, really helpful, really helpful. So I would, um, I, I've dealt with lots and lots of hypersthesia, over grooming, um, self mutilation, even. I've, I've, I've treated many, many self mutilation, self mutilation cases with cats because it can get that extreme. But homeopathy is really amazing for that. Thanks, Julie. And, and Andrea has the spay and neuter products for dogs and for cats. Um, yes, she has, has that too confirmed by the dermatologist. Oh, okay. She, I don't even know if I'm talking, if I'm reading the, oh, she has that too, the, the hypersthesia, I guess she's saying. Yes. Well, I would, I would, oh, you are working with Andrea. Okay. Um, I don't know how long she's had this either, but, um, uh, the, the remedies, the remedies that has been really helpful with, with that is, is anacardium. Um, Andrea will know all that. Even sometimes if they've had, if it has started, from being spayed and neuter because I think the trauma can can shift that like the emotional and physical trauma together but if they use ketamine ketamine can have long lasting um emo like really traumatic emotional consequences really bad ketamine is like special k right it's the it's the date rate drug so what they say, Don Hamilton and I did a lot on this, Dr. Don Hamilton and I, where they, um, they, they think that there's an, an anesthetic effect to ketamine, meaning that they don't, it knocks them out enough that they don't feel pain. They used to give just straight ketamine and do, and do, oh my God, and do declaws, cat declaws. And then they, ketamine doesn't, it only makes them when someone's being raped on Special K, you can feel they can feel everything, but they can't move. They're paralyzed. So that's a similar experience with cats that get ketamine that aren't really, really topped up with with anti pain or, or anesthetic. So I just hate that drug so much. I oh. feel it's it's brutal. So anytime you have a cat that has ever had any kind of post-surgical emotional or you really can link it to to their to their anything and you've linked it to after post-surgery whether it's dental whether it's whatever it doesn't matter try and find out if they use ketamine because you can actually give homeopathic ketamine and really get um, a big segue into their, into their healing. If you do that. And Sarah said on sessions too, that she has that Sarah Griffiths. Ketamine. Yeah. So does Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody hang in there. We're a wave our cat fans. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, just if you have more questions, I'm, I'd be happy to ask, you know, can send them, send them to Facebook or send them to Kaylin or Stephanie. And um, I, I try to help a little extra with cats because there isn't the, the support out there. So there we go. I wonder if you can even see. Hi. Hi. Do you guys want to see my cat? One of my cats? Yes. You do? Yes. Who is it, Julie? It's Footy. Footy. Uh, this is my little Footy. Hi, Footy. She is my sweetest, well, 
heart. Was <laughs> see her feet? She's the most amazing cat on the planet. She um she was hit by a car in Ontario when I was visiting or helping my mom go through um uh her eighty she was eighty years old and she was having hip surgery. And um uh my sister and I were driving home at like 11:30 at night from the hospital driving down a back road and um and she was in front of us on the road she got hit by a car and the person hit her ran her over and just kept driving and i was like oh my god i can see you better that way can you see you yes he is i think i know <laughs> anyways um she was hit by a car and I got out and I picked her up and blood from every orifice out her ears, her eyes, her mouth. Uh, I basically sat on the side of the road with her just until she died. Thought, okay, I'm just going to just kept saying to her, you know, I'll just sit with you. Don't worry. You know, just leave. It's okay. And then my sister said, Julie, you've got all the rent, all your emergency remedies in the car from mommy. And I'm like, okay, bring them, bring them, bring them. So she brought this, you know, kit that I had in case something happened traumatic to my mother. And, um, uh, you know, had everything, arnica, aconite, high, 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 high potencies of everything. And so I sat on the side of the road and it's like, they were pellets though, right? So I, I don't know how I did it, but I was like, I just felt, I just had such a heart my heart was just attached to that cat like instantly. And I was, this is gross, but this is what I did. <laughs> I wanted her just to die. I just wanted her to die and not suffer. So I took Arnica and Aconite, high potencies of Arnica and Aconite thinking, okay, the Arnica will help with her pain and the Aconite will help with her fear and she'll just die. So I was taking pellets and chewing them and then spitting them on my fingers and then rubbing them into her gum and just saying to her, you know, it's okay, sweetheart, just go. I'm not going to leave you. It's good. It's good. And I kept doing that. And within about, I don't know, 25 minutes, she sort of sat up. Right. And she was like all staggery. She had no pupils. She had nothing. You couldn't see her iris. You couldn't see anything. She looked like she had snake eyes. Like they were on the sides of her head. And I had my cell phone and I called the vet clinic that I used to work for. And I said to them, um, do you remember me? I, I used to work for you. And he said, of course I remember you. It was like midnight by then. He said, of course I remember you. I thought you were in Vancouver. And I said, no, no, no. I, I am in Vancouver, but I'm here visiting my mom and I'm on my way home. And this cat got by a car and I want to bring her in. Will you meet me there? And he said, well, what, whose cat, what cat? And I said, I don't know. He goes, well, where are you? And I told him where I was. He goes, Julie, it's a barn cat. He said, who's going to pay for this? And I said, I'm going to pay for it. Are you going to meet me or not? And he was so, he was so ticked off. He's like, oh my God, nothing effing changes with you. <laughs> and so he met me, he met me there and he looked at her. He said, I'm going to get the youth and all. We just put her down. Like she's just, She's never going to be the same. She's going to be a vegetable. I said, look, give her a shot of, de uh, give her a shot of dexamethasone and give me some IV fluids. I'm taking her home. If you had seen this cat 40 minutes ago and what she's like right now, this cat does not want to die. And I got to see her on the light. And so we gave her a shot of steroids and um, I gave her got some IV to take home. And I took her home and she had, she was really young. She was probably only maybe not even a year and she had milk. Right. And I was like, Oh my God, she's got kittens and the kittens are going to die. Anyway, she got her home. I, tra I treated her all night long, um, gave her fluids and, you know, it took, it was a long row, but she, she recovered. And then when she started recovering, I was, I went back to the place and for sure she was a she was a barn cat because they, they all looked almost exactly like her they didn't obviously want her back nor was she in any kind of shape but she it took her about a month to fully recover and maybe more 
and um, they didn't want her back. And then I phoned Karen from Boca and I'm like, what do I do? Oh my God, she's got babies somewhere. And she said, Julie, try not to worry if it's a big colony, they'll look after each other's babies. So I phoned um, a board certified uh, uh, neuro specialist in, in Vancouver. And I said, I want to bring her home, but I have to fly her. He said, oh, you'll have to stay at least two weeks longer. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't risk bringing her home. So anyways, I stayed two weeks longer. I brought her home. I brought her right on the plane. And, um, you know, here's this cat from a barn. And then, you know, two weeks later, she's on a plane going back to Vancouver. And so I took her home. I already had five cats and I put her in a room alone. Cause I just wanted to make sure that she didn't have viruses and the whole nine yards. I took, put her in a room and it's like, my gosh, you're getting fat. Like I'm not even feeding, you're getting porky. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, she's pregnant. <laughs> oh my God, she's actually pregnant. And she was, she was pregnant. She was hit by a car, went through all that trauma and maintained and, and didn't abort her babies. Wow. Still was pregnant. So I was like, oh no, <laughs> we have five cats. And I said to her, okay, listen, I know you lost your babies and let's make a deal here because I don't want, if you have babies, I don't want to take them away from you because you've already lost your other babies. Please don't have a lot of babies. Just, just have a few babies please, and I'll keep them all. Yeah. So the night she had them, it was just this crazy night. There was like a full moon and anyways, whatever. It was a kind of a weird situation. She had three kittens and I swear to God, the first one, his name is Hagrid. His head was as like half the size of her body. This poor thing having these babies. And I said, it was either one of two things. Either she had, when I told her, please don't have a lot of babies. And she just like willed herself and took them from seven, seven into three. So she could keep them all. Or she really only had three and being injected with a steroid when she was pregnant she had monster cats because one of them is 26 pounds and the other one is 19. They have, they have canines on them, like my dog. They're these massive, massive cats. And she's maybe, maybe six pounds, five pounds, six pounds. So anyways, she's a very, very, every time I look at her, I am just completely inspired by her will to live and her um, ability to to still produce healthy babies, even though what she went through. So then when she got those tumors, I was devastated and they didn't think she was going to live very long. And I thought, well, you know, probably from being hit by a car. And anyways, she's was probably under a year when I got her and she's going to be 14 and she's been living with these tumors for four years so she's she's my inspiration she's one of my um my little gurus when i feel sorry for myself i look at her and go yeah no wow, wow. thanks for sharing julie mm -hmm. so for anyone that loves cats she's uh she's pretty special Miracle cat, yeah. Yeah, they're all miracles, every one of them. Thanks, Julie. That was nice. Kim was saying, and I agree with her. I wasn't expecting to cry on the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> really nice story, Julie. Thanks for sharing. And thanks, everyone, for sticking around and hanging out with us tonight. Okay, thanks, guys. Time. See you later, everybody. Have a Bye, safe, everyone. happy week. Good night.